Hi there, my name is uh, Miles Paget, and I'm a professor of optics at the University of Glasgow in Scotland and my interest is uh, twisted light beams. So, what's a twisted light beam? So if I was to take a laser pointer in my hand and, and shine it at you, you know that you would get slightly hotter, uh, about you know, three milliwatts worth of laser beam. Take a long time to boil a kettle. But as well as making you hotter, it also pushes you away because light carries a radiation pressure. Now, when you work out how much that is, it's the power in the light beam divided by the speed of light. The speed of light is very high, and so the force I exert on you is just a few piconewtons. But on the other hand, if you are only a micron across, then a few piconewtons is quite a lot of force, and you will start accelerating pretty quickly. And that is the physics behind the technique which is called optical tweezers. And I'm interested in optical tweezers. But I'm not just interested in light's push, I'm interested in light's twist. So if I wanted to use my laser beam to open a door handle, I need to both push the door and twist the knob. And light has a twist too. It has a twist in the spin of every photon, of h bar per photon, but then it was recognized in the 1990s that in addition to that twist, it carried an extra twist, a twist that we call orbital angular momentum. And this twist can be orders of magnitude higher than the photon spin. And that means we can not only pick up little objects, but make them dizzy too, make them rotate around. And that's the thing that we, at the time we called an optical, optical spanner. So what do these beams look like? A normal laser beam comes towards you and you see a, a bright spot of light. One of our twisted light beams comes towards you and you get a thing that looks a bit like a bagel. It's got a hole in the middle. And it's a dark hole that runs all the way along the light beam from the source to the object. And around that dark hole, the optical energy flows round and round and round. And so these dark holes are sometimes called optical vortices. So optical vortices, the orbital angular momentum of the light that surrounds them, this is the thing that I'm interested in. So having explained to you why you might want to be interested in these twisted light beams, an obvious question is, hey, how do I, how do I make one of those beams? It turns out to be, to be really simple. If I draw a series of straight lines and rule them into a piece of glass, I've made a diffraction grating. And when I shine my laser beam at that diffraction grating, you know that you'll generate a series of spots on the screen on the other side. So how can I change that diffraction grating? Well, I can take one of those lines and turn it into a fork. So one line comes up, splits into two lines. Now, that means I have more lines at the top of my diffraction grating than I have at the bottom which means the diffraction angle at the top is larger than the one at the bottom. And so now, my first order diffracted beam has a twist to it. So the important thing is I take my laser beam, I illuminate not just any bit of the diffraction grating, I illuminate the bit of the diffraction grating that contains the fork. And by illuminating the fork, I ensure that my first order diffracted beam is a twisted light beam. It looks like the bagel, a bright ring of light with a dark hole in the centre. First and foremost, I'm a physicist. I'm interested in trying to understand um, what light beams are. So one of the things we do is we use them within an optical tweezers to create an optical spanner. Unlike the polarisation state of light, which can just be left or right, and if I think about that from communication point of view, it can be a one and a zero. The interesting thing about the orbital angular momentum is that a fork in my diffraction grating doesn't just have one prong, I can make a fork with two prongs, or three prongs, or four prongs. Each of those gives more twist to the beam. So unlike the spin angular momentum that can only be a one or a zero, the orbital angular momentum can be an A, a B, a C, a D, an E. And that way we can put much more information onto a single photon. So orbital angular momentum is interesting from a point of view of communication. So we've got manipulation, we've got communication. Why else is orbital angular momentum interesting? You might think that it's just some weird and wonderful property that's produced by uh, physicists in a lab with their fork diffraction gratings, but actually we've all seen it. If I just take a laser beam and shine it at the wall, we're familiar with the concept of optical speckle. Optical speckle, those little dark specks which you see scattered amongst the larger beam, each of those little specks is actually an optical vortex. Sometimes the light is swirling clockwise, sometimes the light is swirling anticlockwise. So optical vortices exist in light beams all around us. But the light beam doesn't just exist on the screen, 
It exists in three dimensions. It's everywhere. The light's everywhere between the screen and the source that created it. So these little spots of light are not spots at all. They're dark lines. But as the speckle changes, so the dark lines weave around. And so in actual fact, these, if you think of a, a room full of laser light, it at the most fundamental level is riddled with these dark lines of no light which twist and turn around each other, forming loops and even knots within the optical field. So that light itself is structured, its topology defined by these lines of darkness. And I think what optical angular momentum has done for the community as a whole probably is taught us all that when we're shaping light beams as well as shaping the intensity of the light beam, something that holography would have told us all along is that you have to also shape the phase of the light beam. And by shaping the phase of the light beam, the thing that we can't see, then we can change the things that the light beam does.